Thank you. Uh, if you don't have a handout, there are some, some up, here, up front here. Um, uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be uh, back here. Um, until a few years ago, uh, the only place in Texas I'd been was the airport. But now I've been, I've been back uh, about four times since. So uh, the first time was a, a trip that we um, had taken to uh, eastern Texas to look at Magnolia Fraseri Pyramidata. So that's when I uh, first met uh, David Creech and I met uh, Daryl and Gerald Dur Durham here in the second row. And that was a wonderful trip. We had started in... Um, Florida, and I'll show you some pictures of Magnolia Fraseri Pyramidata, and uh, kind of went through its range, which is the southern coastal plain, and ended up in East Texas, where we actually saw the best uh, and biggest of the Magnolia Fraseri Pyramidata. And I, I've always, from the north, I was always told that everything's uh, uh, bigger in Texas, and it's true, <laughs> and better, right? <laughs> Uh, also, in addition to thanking uh, uh, Dr. Creech, I want to thank Jared Barnes, who uh, uh, I knew from uh, when he was a summer intern at uh, the Scott Arboretum at Swarthmore College. I also want to thank Adam, Adam Black from Peckerwood, who was nice enough to pick me up at the airport and drive me all the way here and back tomorrow. So uh, thank you to all, all of you. If you don't like magnolias, you might want to leave now, because this is uh, 130 continuous slides of, uh, or images uh, of magnolias. And a lot of these are from the book that I wrote for Timber Press on, on magnolias. And I did have to cut out some, because um, you know, otherwise we'd be here for five hours. And I tried to tailor make it a little bit to uh, your climate. So uh, ones that are maybe a, um, can take uh, the, some of the heat that you have, but also ones that will thrive in, in some of your more mild winters. So like the last 20 images or, or so, none of those would grow in Chicago. So Chicago is more like zone five, and you guys are zone eight. So you're considerably warmer uh, than Chicago dur during the winter especially. So why don't we get started? And if, if you have any questions, just uh, uh, yell them out. We're a relatively small crowd, so we can be relatively informal as well. Uh, so this is where I used to work, the Scott Arboretum, which is in, uh, just south of Philadelphia. It has a very large uh, magnolia collection. It's on the campus of Swarthmore College, which is a small uh, liberal arts college. These are mainly uh, saucer magnolias. So just a few magnolias just to kind of get uh, a feel for things. This is Magnolia Legend. We'll talk quite a bit about the different yellow magnolias. Uh, this too is at uh, Swarthmore. Jared will recognize many of these uh, images. And this is in our Pinetum. One of the best ways to kind of showcase magnolias is, especially deciduous types, is to provide an evergreen backdrop for them. This is uh, uh, the, the evergreen on the right is uh, Hinoki cypress, Camicyparis obtusa. This is one called Slavin snowy. And with magnolias, especially the spring flowering one, it, when they bloom is completely dependent on what that spring is like, and also where, where you live. So in Chicago, magnolias really don't start flowering until middle of May. You know, here that's probably like summertime, right? There it's like still pretty cold. Uh, you know, conversely, you know, say down in Tallahassee, you know, magnolias, their magnolia season might start in January in a, in a lot of years because it's just that mild. So, you know, when I talk about some of these, I may talk more in terms of like, you know, early spring, mid spring, late spring, or just er early or, or late winter flowering versus, uh, you know, the actual month that they flower. So uh, starting with the, your uh, list, I thought I'd start with some of the native magnolias that are grown for kind of, they're as much grown for the big tropical looking foliage as they are for their flowers. And the, the first one is, uh, uh, Magnolia macrophylla, and you'll find Magnolia macrophylla is far north for, in its native ranges, uh, southern Ohio, Kentucky, Georgia, I've seen it in the wild in Alabama, northern Florida, and it has these very large leaves up to 18 inches long. Uh, the flowers are born later in the spring, so you know, actually when the leaves have come out. Uh, they're fragrant flowers, 
And with a lot of magnolias, they are fragrant. They're not all fragrant, but many, many are. And you would grow it as much for that, that big kind of tropical foliage. They also have um, uh, large fruits, large follicles. And those can turn a, a pinkish red color, which can be or ornamental as well. Uh, this is uh, a plant that we're just talking about. There's one uh, under the bench here that uh, the Durham Brothers grew from seed this year, and it's already about two and a half feet tall. This is Magno Magnolia macrophylia ashii, which is sometimes called the ash magnolia. It's interesting that its only native range is in about five counties in the, the panhandle of, of Florida. And it's, it has all the attributes of macrophylla, but it's more diminutive. So macrophylla at maturity might reach 50 feet tall. Uh, Ashii maybe 15 to 20 feet tall, if not even, even smaller. So it has small stature, still has big leaves, big flowers. Uh, in the east, blooms in May, probably here, probably more April, kind of a sweet lemony uh, fragrance. Large flowers, large leaves. And you often at the, the base, whoops, that was not the pointer, obviously. At the base of, so with magnolias, the, the showy part are not actually petals. They're a mo modified petal called a tepal. So at the base of the tepal, there's often a, a purple splotch. And you would think a plant that's native in northern Florida might not, be or might not be hardy here, or definitely wouldn't be hardy in Chicago, but it's actually perfectly hardy in Chicago, and it would be perfectly hardy here as well. And the undersides of the leaves are a nice silver color, but that's kind of, um, you would only see that attribute if you're laying on your back looking up into the foliage. So it's nothing that's uh, you know, a strong ornamental attribute otherwise. Another one that kind of falls into that category is Magnolia fraseri. Uh, fraseri doesn't have as large a leaves as, say, Macrophylla or Ashii. This is found all throughout the mountains in the southern Appalachian uh, uh, forests. It's fairly, fairly common, can also get about 30 to 50 feet tall. The flowers are born kind of sporadically uh, up amongst the, the canopy, which is the same as true with uh, uh, Macrophylla and Tripetala and some of the other uh, large leaf magnolias. You can see the leaves on um, uh, Fraseri. So if you look at the, the base of the leaves, it has what's called a, an auriculate base. It has two lobes that look like ear lobes. And you find that on Macrophylla and also on um, Macrophylla ashii. These are kind of lousy pictures for Fraseri pyramidata, but uh, just ask the Durham brothers. The flowers are like born way up in the canopy. It's not exactly easy to see them, but if you're interested in native magnolias, and there's seven magnolias that are native to the United States, uh, you know, this is one that's probably the hardest to find if you're trying to buy one. There's a great nursery in Aiken, South Carolina called Woodlanders. It's a mail order nursery, and they've They've had Fraseri pyramidata uh, in the past. When we were collecting it, you know, most of the, because the flowers are born high up in the canopy, so are the seed. So it was difficult to collect seed. We had kind of a, a bean bag with a rope, and we'd throw it up there and wrap it around the branch and then tug down the seed. But as you're tugging the seed, they're often kind of dehissing, and then you're trying to pick them off uh, the, the, the floor of the, uh, of the forest. The ones we found here in Texas also had seed actually relatively close to the ground, so it was easier uh, to harvest. So you'll find this in northern Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and the westernmost population is here in, in East Texas. And those, in theory, are probably the ones that have uh, as good a heat tolerance and drought tolerance as any of them. There's a close-up of uh, Fraseri pyramidata. This is one in cultivation in, in an arboretum. And then this is Magnolia tripetala. So tri tripetala is similar to uh, Macrophylla, has very big leaves, up to 24 inches long, uh, white flowers born in the later part of spring. But one of the differences between tripetala 
at Ashii macrophylla is the, the flowers are fetid, and fetid means it stinks. They, they're not, not, it's not a good smell. So, uh, but it's not going to give off a lot of fragrance in any case because there's not a lot of flowers to begin with. And the one way to tell a macrophylla and tri tripetala apart, the easiest way, is if you look at the base of the leaf on tripetal, it just tapers to a point, while on macrophylla, it has those two lobes. And then a close-up of the flowers. And later on in the program, we'll talk about some uh, complex hybrids. And a lot of hybridizers nowadays are using uh, both macrophylla and tripetal in some uh, uh, advanced hybrids, because what they're trying to do is take other species and take these large flowers and create some new cultivars that have very large and interesting flowers that are born in more, more perfusion. Uh, Magnolia virginiana, uh, so this is a sweet bay magnolia that's na native in, uh, in, in Texas. And uh, there's kind of two varieties of, it, uh, of this. The one that you'll see most in cultivated, cultivation is Magnolia virginiana variety australis, and that's kind of the southern form of the sweet bay magnolia. So the southern range is kind of northern, uh, well, North Carolina, south all the way into Florida, into Cuba, and then west into uh, Texas. And it's one of the very few magnolias that can grow in really wet conditions. You often see it by the edge of a pond or the edge of a stream or edge of a lake. Uh, if you have a part of your yard that's really kind of sopping wet, you know, almost marshy, then, and you want to try magnolia, then I would try virginiana. Almost all the other magnolia species are very intolerant of poorly drained soils. Uh, so Virginia's, Virginiana's attributes are, it can either be grown as a single trunk tree or sometimes as a multi-stem, almost thicket-like plant. Uh, it blooms late, I'll show you some flowers in a moment, uh, later spring, but it has a really sweet lemony fragrance, so, and that's where it gets the name Sweet, sweet Bay. The sweet is from the flowers, and bay is because it looks like the, the bay laurel uh, somewhat. So here's the flowers uh, here. So born sporadically, and they start blooming late May, but you also get sporadic flowers all, all summer long as well, sometimes even into uh, er early uh, fall. The undersides of the leaves are also silver, but in the case with this plant, uh, if it's slightly windy, the, the leaves will kind of shimmer and it will reveal kind of that silver underside of the leaf. Uh, this is one called Moon Glow. There are some cultivars out there. Moon Glow is one that's supposed to have slightly larger uh, flowers. In the north, uh, the Australis types tend to be either semi-deciduous or deciduous. Down here, all the Australis types would be almost fully evergreen. And there are some selections like uh, a Green Bay is a good example that's a, a good evergreen one for more north, but down here just be, uh, would, would be evergreen. Uh, there's another one called Henry Hicks I'll show you in a moment, which is also fairly evergreen. Close up of the flowers of uh, Moon Glow. This is uh, Henry Hicks. This is also at uh, Swarthmore College was actually selected there. Henry Hicks was a famous Long Island nurseryman and his daughter went to Swarthmore College and when he would come down to visit his daughter he'd bring plants and this is one that stood out especially because of its uh, ability to be more evergreen and more northern climates. Also has pretty good habit I think. A sweet thing is a relatively new kind of breakthrough in the Magnolia virginiana world in that it's more kind of shrub like so it's kind of a round evergreen shrub. So if you're looking for you know, a nice evergreen shrub that's not a rhododendron or a camellia or a cherry laurel, you might, you might consider this. So it goes under the name, um, uh, Sweet Thing is the, the trademark name, but its cultivar is uh, Perry Page, same thing. So you know, this one's a bit more mature, and there's a nice kind of 10-gallon nursery um, size plant. It should flower. I, you know, I've never, I've, I've only, yes? We had a storm <laughs> before the very first, 
Yep. Never flowered. Never flowered? Okay. Well, then a nice green blob in the landscape. <laughs> Which, like, up, you know, up in, uh, well, Chicago doesn't count because the only thing that's evergreen in Chicago are uh, boxwoods and, like, uh, a blue holly, like an emaciated blue holly. That's it. So if we could actually grow that, that would be a, that even if it was only green, would be good for us. A Mardi Gras is an actually pretty good um, uh, evergreen one. This also goes under the name uh, Maddie Mae Smith. They're the same thing. And uh, I've seen this growing in the shade and really lights up kind of a shady spot. It hold, that, that variegation is relatively stable in the landscape. Now this is, I know this is a somewhat ubiquitous plant in uh, Nagadoches as well as I'm sure almost everywhere in Texas. This is Magnolia grandiflora, which is uh, the southern magnolia, which is, uh, in my opinion, it's one of the most versatile of all the magnolias. It can serve a lot of different purposes in the landscape. It's uh, tough as nails, assuming you have it in the right kind of, um, say, zone 6B or, or higher. Uh, there's all sorts of different forms. It can be used for hedging. Has you know incredible large flowers in the summer that are you know have a real lemony uh, fragrance. There's now some small ones. There's some narrow ones. There's ones that have really great undersides of the leaves that have that brown indumentum. Uh, the one thing I will say about two things that are kind of shortcomings of Magnolia grandiflora is almost impossible to do any type of gardening underneath them. I mean if you you know, in the gardening world, you hear about dry shade. There is no drier shade than under the canopy of a magnolia grandiflora. And then, um, do you guys ever have a snow here? Yeah. Rarely. Rarely. Well, probably if you did, it would be like a wet, heavy snow. And these are extremely brittle with like a heavy, wet snow. So up in Swarthmore, on it, from time to time, you know, it'd snow, but it wasn't quite cold enough to be a fluffy snow. And that wet, heavy snow just uh, these are, you know, break the tops out of every one of these. But also, I guess it's a testament to its durability. Even when the tops get knocked out, they quickly send up lots of new shoots. In a couple of years, you don't even, you can't even notice the damage. So one of my favorites is a Dee Dee Blanchard, which is uh, upright in its form. It has, as you can see here. Uh, if you look at the undersides of the leaves, it has that kind of rustity brown indumentum, which I, I like. Uh, you get the same with a Bracken's Brown Beauty. Dee Dee Blanchard is uh, uh, one of the hardier ones. And so Swarthmore zone was 6B. It's now 7A. And uh, not all Magnolia grandifloras do well there. Like Little Gem, which I saw several planted on campus driving in here, for whatever reason is not hard perfectly hardy in Swarthmore, but uh, Dee Dee Blanchard uh, is. Close-up of uh, the flowers, and then the great foliage on uh, Dee Dee Blanchard. Do you have that here? This is uh, an interesting treatment of uh, a magnolia. This is uh, in, uh, Cape Harris. Uh, so this is trained as an espalier. And with magnolias, you can, pr you can treat them as a spalier. I was at a, a, a garden on uh, Lake Maggiore in front of a hotel. And the hotel was about four stories tall. And there was this beautiful clipped one, like a gigantic gumdrop. And uh, they were out there with scaffolding and their falcos, clip, clip. You know, because you can't shear a magnolia grandiflora because you'll cut all the leaves. So you have to really, to do this type of pruning would be one cut at a time. That's all right. That's why we love gardening, right? We love that. Uh... <laughs> so this is Cape Harris. So if you like Magnolia grandiflora, but you don't really have the room for a plant that could ultimately get 60, 70, 80 feet tall, there are some diminutive ones. There's one, um, this one, Cape Harris, is thought to be probably a, a seedling a seedling from a uh, little gem, which is also a diminutive one, and probably Bracken's Brown Beauty, it's, it's thought to be. So it has that 
brown in momentum, but everything about it's small. So it only gets about uh, 15 feet tall at maturity. The leaves are small, the flowers are small. And there's another new one out, Baby, Baby Grand, I think is another smallish one. This one is uh, at Swarthmore College, and this was planted the summer there was an intern, which is 86. And this plant looks, its, it's width is almost exactly the same as it was 30 years ago. It's a very upright columnar uh, cultivar called Hassi. So I'll stop there. There's lots of other grand grandifloras. Obviously, you could do a whole lecture just on grandifloras. Uh, for many years in the magnolia world, the kind of holy grail of magnolias were the yellow magnolias. It was thought that a, a yellow could be produced. There's a, one of the natives I didn't show you is magnolia cuminata, the cucumber magnolia. And if you look closely at those flowers, they are kind of ye yellowish. So it was theorized that you know, maybe you could take the yellow of magnolia cuminata and cross it with something else and create a, a truly yellow magnolia. So some hybridizers at Brooklyn Botanic Garden in the early 60s started working with uh, Acuminata and Denudata, which is the Uland magnolia. And the first yellow that came out of that program is El Elizabeth. And um, Elizabeth is, uh, it does get fairly large at maturity, probably f almost 40 to 50 feet tall, has really kind of a soft yellow flower that comes out before the leaves come out. So Cuminata also blooms later, so that's why some of the yellows bloom later. Uh, Denudata has uh, a fragrance, so some yellows have fragrance, some don't. Most are Acuminata times Denudata, but I'll show you a couple others that have another species or two thrown in. Um, and then, you know, there's been many, many yellows since then, so you know, Elizabeth was a first, and then there was a couple others. But if you were to collect every yellow magnolia on the market today, there's probably 70 cultivars, which is probably about 65 too many. But that's, that's true with many things. You know, daylilies, does anybody collect daylilies? They estimate that there's 7,000 new daylily cultivars on the market every year. So, you know, I guess uh, uh, magnolias pale in uh, comparison. Close-up of Elizabeth, really, really pale yellow, slightly fragrant. I think, I still think uh, Elizabeth's one of the best yellows. It has great vigor. So the, par the parent Acuminata is a mature tree, gets almost 100 feet tall, or does get 100 feet tall. Um, so the size on some of these yellows can actually get quite large over time. That's kind of... Uh, typical fall color of many magnolias. So I would say most magnolias have kind of a yellow or brown, brownish fall color. You know, you wouldn't grow them just for their fall color. You grow them for their flowers, obviously. But I would say they hold their own as far as fall color goes. One of my top 10 magnolias, period, which is also a yellow, is one called Magnolia Lois, which also came out of that Brooklyn Botanic Arm program. It's a more kind of stout growing plant. Uh, doesn't grow as quickly, stays a bit more diminutive in size. The flowers themselves are held upright and are kind of a tulip-shaped or chalice-shaped. It's really a beauty. I would, um, uh, there's a new one out called uh, Honey, Honey something, Honey, honey Melon, Honey Dew, Honey Lemon, something honey that has flowers that are um, similar to this one. Honey love, that's it. Uh, gold crown, it's nice, but the problem with gold crown is it starts to bloom as the leaves are coming out. So then the, the flowers are somewhat shrouded by the leaves, although it does have very big flowers that are upward facing. Sun spire has spire-shaped flowers, but it's also a narrow, upright, uh, magnolia as well, so kind of spire-shaped in, in its habit. Another favorite of the uh, yellow magnolias is butterflies. And uh, uh, butterflies was um, hybrid by, hybridized by Phil Savage, who's from Michigan. So it also has really good hardiness, uh, supposedly hardy to like 25 below. Probably never gets that cold here, does it? <laughs> uh, you're lucky. 
Uh, just a quick little Illinois story. So I, I didn't, I was born in Illinois, moved away, came back for high school, moved away, came back, this is my third time there. But in high school, I remember one day it was, uh, the regular temperature was 37 below, and the wind chill was 82 below. So if you ever think about moving north, don't. <laughs> so butterflies has great hardiness. It also is the earliest to flower of, of most of the yellows. Uh, so you can see here, obviously, it's flowering way before the leaves are even thinking about coming out. Great profusion of flowers. I'd say butterflies is one of the heaviest uh, of, the, of the yellow to flower. You know, also, and you know, one of the things I, I can't easily comment on is depending on, you know, how the, the heat that you have throughout the year, some yellows in some climates, like up north, they may be more intensely yellow. And like in Tallahassee, as an example, it will be more bleached out yellow. So that is something to just, just be aware of. This is Gold Star, which has a, uh, this is one that has three parents. So the two parents are cumin data and denia data, but then also there's some stellata is one of the parents. This is stellata is a star magnolia, which I'll show you later. So that's why it has this more kind of star-shaped uh, flower. But the problem with it, and you can see it a little bit in this image, is the flowers are kind of born sporadically throughout the plant. So it's not born in such profusion as some of the other uh, yellows. I like yellow bird, but it's real shortcoming as it does flower when the leaves are almost fully out. So you can see the flowers are really kind of almost lost amongst the foliage. I think the, the best show for magnolias for the deciduous types are before the leaves come out. So you, you're only seeing the flowers. But it does have, have a, a pretty flower, nonetheless. And then one of my favorites, and I would put this in my top 10 category, and this may be for uh, sentimental reasons. So when I started the Scott Arboretum in 1986, the director was Judy Zook. And that's who this magnolia is named for. She then subsequently went on to uh, the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, which I mentioned earlier was known for creating Lois and Elizabeth. And I, I bought this plant or originally. It was called Magnolia BBGRC1164. So if you have that, you actually have Judy Zook. And it, I think it, some, somebody had gone to Brooklyn Botanic Garden, you know, taken the cuttings or given the cuttings, and that's all it was listed as. You know, it just had a kind of a breeder's number. And then uh, later on in her career at Brooklyn Botanic Garden, they named that one in, in, in her honor because it also came out of that same early 60s uh, uh, breeding program. And its parents, again, are accumulated, denia data. But then it also has, um, I think, Lilliflora is one of the parents. Oops. So the flowers are, if you look at them, they are kind of yellowish. But they also have kind of a suffusion of pink at the base uh, uh, of the, the tepal. And there's a close-up. It's fairly later, late flowering for the yellows. It's a very upright tree for, for most of its uh, uh, youth, for sure, and then just broadens a little bit over time. And uh, it has a fragrance almost unlike most other magnolias in that it smells like that uh, health food cereal, um, Fruit Loops. Kind of kidding about the health food part. Yeah. <laughs> if you were to cut that and put it in your home, how long would it last? You know, like our yeah. sub magnolias, they don't last very long. They don't, same. Yeah, they're, they're pretty short lived as a cut flower, not to say that they can't be. And what I would do with magnolias is actually um, uh, get them while they're still in bud and then force them to come you know, out of bud and then they'll last a little bit longer. But they're pretty. Uh, pretty ephemeral as a cut flower. I, uh, another little side story, I, um, this was years ago, probably at least 10 years ago, I got asked to be on the Martha Stewart Living Show to do a, a, a segment on magnolias. So that morning I got up really early, she had her studio up, up in Connecticut, I cut a bunch, you know, put them in buckets, put them in my SUV, had like all these pillows, everything in between, because I didn't want to get up there and have you know all the flowers having 
fallen, fallen off. And then she did, a, her whole seg segment was, like I talked about the Magnolia, and then she made this big uh, arrangement on stage. And it was right around the time that it she hadn't uh, had her hearing yet. Um, and they, you know, they were doing all the makeup and everything, and uh, they're like, "Whatever you do, don't bring up, uh, you know, her court case." And I was like, "Yeah, right. I'm gonna like use that as my icebreaker with uh, Martha Stewart." <laughs> <laughs> Another one that's that same parentage, Denya Data and Acuminata, is 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 Ivory Chalice. Although it really reads as a, more of a white, really, than, than, than a yellow. So many of you have probably heard of uh, what are called the girls or the little girl hybrids. And they're, they're um, kind of a hybrid group that came out of the National Arboretum in the early 1960s. And most of them are a hybrid between Stellata, which is a star magnolia, which is more shrub-like, and Lilliflora, which is also a, kind of a shrubby, Magnolia. And what they created were magnolias that actually bloom, uh, still deciduous, but bloom later than, say, the star magnolia or magnolia Leibneri or Chiwensis or uh, Salicifolia. So they really, especially in northern climates, never run the risk of really getting frosted because they bloom late enough. And there, there's uh, seven altogether. There's, um, this one is uh, uh, Anne. These first two are Anne. And then a lighter pink one is, is Betty. And I'd say for most of their, their lives, they're really more kind of big shrubs or little trees. It's only, and these ones are from the original distribution in 1962, so they're you know, over uh, 50, you know, 55 years old. And at 55 years, they're more like, say, 20 feet by 20 feet. So they do get into a, a large shrub or small tree uh, at, at maturity. Uh, that's Betty. Judy, the one that's most popular is probably Anne. Like if you went into, you know, most garden centers around the United States, the, the magnolias you're going to find are probably a star magnolia, one of the girls, prob probably, probably Anne, uh, maybe Leonard Messel, magnolia Leibneri. Probably around here you'd pro probably find a southern magnolia. But other than that, you, you know, you would be lucky to find a couple others. You wouldn't find, you know, a choice of, 30 different magnolias in most uh, garden centers. Also, to come on the National Arboretum, and, and uh, Dave and I were talking about this one earlier, is Magnolia Spectrum. So Spectrum's kind of a medium-sized tree to about 30 feet tall, uh, round, fairly round in its, its habit. That's Spectrum in bud, Spectrum in full flower, and then a sister seedling of Spectrum is Galaxy. And Galaxy has much more of an upright oval head. I've seen Galaxy used as a, a street tree at, at uh, Ohio State uh, University. So I think it has you know, some uh, tolerance of urban conditions. I would say most magnolias are not real tolerant of urban conditions other than uh, the southern magnolia, Magnolia grandiflora is a pretty tough tree. That's uh, Galaxy as well. And then close up of Galaxy. The, flat, the outer teeple on Galaxy is a little more intensely pinkish purple than it is on, on a Spectrum. One of my favorite of all magnolias is Magnolia Springeri. This is Springeri elongata, which blooms uh, kind of mid spring, uh, kind of a, a real light pinkish white. Born, uh, the flowers are born in profusion every year, year in and year out. It's a Chinese uh, species. And a close-up of flowers. There's another one, Spring Rye Diva, which you're more likely to find. And that's just a little pinker than, than this one. I like this one just for the name. This is Big Dude. And uh, to me, that sounds like a, a good Texas name, big, big dude. Um, so this is, actually has Springeri as one of the, uh, the, the parents, Springeri Diva as a parent, and then Solangiana, the saucer magnolia. And it is, uh, you know, they're big, kind of blousy flowers. 
you know, there's nothing uh, overly refined about this, but if you want, want a real uh, significant um, you know, bloom of flowers every year, you might consider this. That's a close-up of uh, of Big Dude. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Star Wars, and uh, this is at uh, uh, Swarthmore College next to the Observatory Dome. So we put all all the ones with kind of galactic names next to the Observatory. I'm sure nobody like you know realized that subtlety. So Star Wars was there, and Spectrum, and Galaxy, and Gold star, but you know, I, I think it was lost on, on, on everyone. Uh, another ho holy grail in the Magnolia world is um, Magnolia Campbellii. You know, that's a, that's a magnolia that you know people that know magnolias really would love to have. It has huge flowers that are up to ten, almost twelve inches across, but it's native to the foothills of the Himalayas. In the foothills of the Himal Himalayas, the most Comparable climate in the United States would be kind of uh, San Francisco when it's 50 and foggy. So kind of that type of uh, atmosphere. Uh, so, you know, that really only exists in San Francisco. And maybe you could get away with this maybe in parts of, say, Seattle or Vancouver. Uh, so Campbellii, while it's probably, would probably technically be hardy here, even technically hardy in Swarthmore, just the, the heat and the heat and humid, you know, that high, the combination of heat and humidity would probably kill, kill it or do it in. But there are, this one, Star Wars, is uh, Campbellii. So it has Campbellii as a parent. And then the other parent is Lilliflora. So Lilliflora brings in a uh, heat tolerance. So it still has fairly big flowers, may, maybe not quite as big as Campbellii, but it's uh, as, as close as you're going to get. Uh, the star magnolias, um, so in the distance here, this is one of the stars. So the star magnolias are one of the most common of all the magnolias, and, and probably rightly so. They, they have incredible profusion of flowers in early spring every year. They can be grown as either kind of a large shrub or a small tree, depending on the, on the cultivar. This one is called a centennial, which was uh, named at the Arnold Arboretum in honor of their 100-year um, centennial in uh, 1972. And uh, so this is more of a, a, a little tree. And what, what's great about the star magnolias, if you look at one individual flower, is they may have up to as many as 70 tepals per flower. Oops. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that one in a second. So, so this one gets about 20 feet tall. Uh, and it, it's just a great small tree. And Stellata is hardy as I have a colleague. I'm on the board of the Magnolia Society, and he's also on the board. And he's a professor at North Dakota State University. And that, yeah, exactly. That's like zone zero, I think. No, I think he's like zone three. But um, it's really cold up there. You know, it gets down to like 50 below. And you know, there's very few magnolias that will, will take those really cold temperatures, but the star magnolia is one of them. But you can also grow star magnolia in probably you know, central Florida and probably throughout all, all of California and probably almost every other state in the United States. Uh, this one is uh, Jane Platt, which is a pinkish one. So with stars, you'll either get white, white, or, or pink. This is one called PRN Select. And then one of my favorites is Chrysanthemum mummiflora. So the name would imply that it looks like a chrysanthemum, which maybe it does a little bit. But the pink is a strong pink. And the flowers are just loaded with, uh, with tepals. You know, really a, whoops, really a great looking plant. And it, you know, it's a small tree, but only to about like 10, 12 feet tall. And then there's kind of a tree version of the star magnolia called Magnolia cobis, which is a, a Japanese uh, native magnolia, a, as is Stellata. And cobis can get up to 60 to 70 feet tall. Uh, cobis is interesting in that a lot of magnolias that you buy as cultivars are actually grafted onto cobis. It's one of the major uh, understocks of all, all magnolias that are grafted. 
And then this one is a hybrid. So if you take Stellata with times Cobus, you get one that's called Magnolia Liebneri. This is a, a large tree-like one called a Morris Fragrance, selected the Morris Arboretum. And then another, I, would, I put this in one of my top tens, and it's probably, you know, next to the star magnolia, one of the most common magnolias in the United States is one called Leonard Messel. And what I like about it is it, uh, it, it blooms relatively early. So on the left, you can see this is a magnolia Ann, which the flower is only just coming out, and then Leonard Messel's in full flower. So a little bit later than star magnolias. It blooms you know, abundantly year in and year round. The flowers are kind of bicolored between kind of a deeper pink and a, and a lighter pink. It's about, say, 12 feet tall by maybe 12 feet wide at maturity. And the great thing about all magnolias is even if you have, you know, a little stick, you'll get a few flowers on it. So it's not like one of those plants where you might have to wait 15 to 20 years before it's mature enough, like a yellow wood, to get really a profusion of flowers. Magnolias, you'll get, it'll get better and better every year. What's that? It grow here? It, I would think it grows here, yes. Confirmation, thumbs up in the back. Yeah, I tried to pick ones that I, I was pretty sure would grow here. Uh, close up of Leonard Messel. Oops. Another top 10 for me is Magnolia cuensis, Wada's memory. So Cobus is one of the parents. And then the Annus magnolia salicifolia is the other parent. It's very upright, kind of oval shaped for the first 20 to 30 years, and then just broadens gradually over the next several decades. Blooms early, so it can run the risk of getting frosted. You know, probably here would be more like uh, sometime in March. In Swarthmore, even, it would be uh, some years the end of March. And fast growing. So this tree. It's probably only about uh, 15 years old. You know, there's even a young tree that's probably, you know, five years or so old. Could I, if they can't, it's fast growing, could I plant a Carolina flag when snow gets on? No, not really. No, I would say. Yeah, no, I would say the only thing you would want to do with this, even as far as like pruning goes, is almost all magnolias are grafted. So you often see like suckers coming up the base. You always want to prune those out. And then you may want to limb it up a little bit over time, but that's more of an aesthetic choice. Uh, but I would say most deciduous magnolias are pretty tolerant of snow, ice, wind. You know, most magnolias are, other than the southern magnolias, don't like severe drought, so if you have periods of drought during the summer, you may want to do a little supplemental watering. So now we're going to start looking at some magnolias that don't like look like your typical magnolia. So this is Magnolia Seboldii, which is one of the Chinese magnolias. It blooms after the leaves come out. It has a, a bud that almost looks like a pendant e egg. And then the flowers open up and they, ha they hang downwards and they're extremely fragrant, extremely hardy. So a lot of people are using Seboldii, especially in northern climates, to bring in hardiness into certain hybrids. And then it, in the center it has this boss of purple stamens. So while the plant is not covered in flowers, each individual flower is really attractive. And I've seen this grown, say, on top of a wall uh, where you kind of look up into the canopy and look look into those nodding uh, flowers. Colossus is even bigger, about five to six inches across. And then a related species is Wilsonii. There's another species, Sinensis, that's similar. Uh, but Seboldii is, you know, it, if it's, it's not that common, but of, of the three is the most common. So this is uh, kind of the same ver <coughs> version, but upward facing. This is Wiesneri, which is a hybrid between Seboldii and Aboveda. Charles Coates. So Charles Coates is Seboldii times Tripetala. So we looked at Tripetala earlier. That's one with the really large leaves. 
So they took that one, large leaves, times um, sabodii, and you have more outward facing flowers with this big kind of tropical foliage. Now for uh, people up north like me, uh, this is a, kind of a, a, bre a breakthrough hybrid. This is grandiflora, so your southern magnolia, times sabodii, and this is so, you know, for us, the holy grail would be to have anything evergreen other than boxwood grow in Chicago. But the real holy grail would be to have, like, what we, you know, we, our version of southern magnolia is going to the florist, buying cut branches, and ha putting it into uh, a holiday wreath. That's about as close as we get to southern magnolia. So this was uh, hybridized by a famous magnolia hybridizer, Dennis Ledvina, who's uh, he passed away, but he was in Green Bay, Wisconsin. So his idea was to take kind of more southern known magnolias and breed in hardiness. So he, he has this exotic star, which I, I would say right now is perfectly hardy in, say, like Indianapolis or even maybe central Illinois. It's not quite, it, it needs a little bit more breeding work to probably be a truly reliable evergreen magnolia in, in Chicago. But I think uh, it's, it's coming. Yes? Oh. Nope. Uh, Ginter Spicy White was uh, hybridized by Bill Smith in Virginia. Tripetala uh, times uh, Sebaldii. Southern Bell is pretty interesting. This is, uh, was done by a fairly famous hybridizer, August Kerr, who lived in uh, Asheville, North Carolina. This is three parents, Sebaldii, Tripetala, and Aboveda. This is a pretty interesting one that was just a chance discovery. So this is Magnolia officinalis, which still has fairly large leaves. But all officinalises uh, were thought to be uh, w white. And I sent this to, there's a famous Magnolia person in South Carolina, Dick Figler, and I sent this to him, and he said this is impossible. There's never been a Magnolia officinalis that's pink. He claimed it was Magnolia photoshopensis. But um, uh, so that, that's the close up. So it's, um, you know, this is really more kind of for the collector, but, uh, you know, big leaves, pink flowers. So the next kind of holy grail, if there is one of Magnolias, is to find a red Magnolia. And there are some magnolias that parade around as, as reds. Like, if you look at that, would you call that red? No, that's like a reddish purple, right? So, but, you know, there are ones that exhibit kind of reddish color, and I think people will continue to hybridize towards uh, that. So this one is uh, uh, Blushing Spire, which is another Dennis Ledvina hybrid. A March Till Frost. And this is a uh, Lilliflora time cylindrica, and it's called March Till Frost because it starts blooming in March and then sporadically all the way through the summer into the fall uh, towards frost. There's a couple of famous hybridizers in New Zealand. One in particular is uh, Mark Jury, and this is uh, Magnolia Black Tulip, which again, kind of reddish purple, only reaches about uh, 12 feet tall at maturity, so relatively small. And that's a close-up of um, black tulip. Do you have that here, David? You do. It's not even that dark. Right, right. So maybe even gets bleached by your, your, your sun and your heat. Genie is another one. That's also from New Zealand. And then just getting into a few kind of interesting oddballs. And then kind of want to show you where kind of hybridizing is going. So this is Nimbus, which is uh, Virginiana. So the Sweet Bay is a parent times Aboveda. So you know now they're taking. You know Virginiana is nice, but the flowers aren't overly profuse or overly uh, striking because they're rel relatively small. So if you could take Virginiana and get in some kind of uh, bigger flowers with more of them, you that would be a breakthrough. So this is uh, Magnolia Sebaldii colossus times Insignis. So Insignis is a, is a new evergreen Chinese species that's kind of come into the hands of some hybridizers. So you know, if you could get a Virginiana uh, or, or 
in Cygnus, you know, with um, kind of a, a big boss of um, stamens, it's also evergreen and fragrant. And KDO is Virginiana times uh, in Cygnus. So to me, that almost looks like a, like a water lily flower. So, you know, one of the things that um, is important with uh, hybridizing is access to germplasm, which is different species, different cultivars. And that, you know, that's really a, 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 an important service that botanic gardens and arboreta play. I mean, that's a service. Another service is just preservation of, of, of species in particular. So, you know, when people are starting to do hybridizing work, like there's a famous hybridizer at North Carolina State University, Tom Rainey, you know, the, the place he goes first before he goes anywhere else is botanic gardens and arboreta, because he knows that they may have like some rare magnolia or rare whatever that they they can then use in some of their hybridization work. And I was just at, um, I, Iowa State has a, a germplasm rep repository for the United States Department of Agriculture, and they hold every cultivar of corn that mankind has ever created that they can find. And they have this big wall of corn cobs, and there's like, you know, some corn cobs that are like what you would think of as sweet corn, big yellow, ears of corn and all, all this. And then there's this like little emaciated, shriveled up corn cob that's like two inches long. And you know, it has a number, maybe even a name. And uh, you know, the guy showing me all this is like, you know, what you know, why would we keep this? And I'm thinking, yeah, why would you keep that? That looks, you know, pathetic. And he said, well, it's it does look pathetic, but that that one cultivar holds the disease resistant, I forgot, the corn disease that, you know, that, that you know, almost every corn crop in the world could potentially get. So you know, when you see some of these things and you're th thinking, why do they even have this in the arboretum, you know, it, it could and very well probably will serve a, a purpose down the road. So that's my little cheer for botanic gardens and arboretum. <laughs> uh, so uh, I, these are all ones I put in. Uh, for your benefit, because these are ones that you can grow in, in your climate here. So fairy blush is part of the blush series. And this is, uh, these are hybrids between uh, Figo, which is the banana shrub, and uh, Dolt Sopa. And these are from Mark Jury as well in uh, uh, New Zealand. So an evergreen shrub, mid-spring, fragrant, relatively small flowers. Good as a hedging plant, screening plant. And then you, you might know Figo, that, that's an old-fashioned shrub called the banana shrub. Um, gets, you know, 10 to 15 feet tall, um, has kind of a banana-like uh, fragrance uh, mid-spring. And then Figo Purple Queen, so that's just a different kind of iteration, kind of these uh, reddish-purple uh, flowers. Now that's a pretty handsome shrub, evergreen. While the flowers are small, they are born in, in profusion. This is Magnolia fortiana. Doesn't even really look like what you would think of a magnolia. And what you know, what we think of is a magnolia doesn't really represent what most magnolias look like. So we we think of deciduous magnolias with pretty flowers, right? Uh, most magnolias in the world, in native parts of the world, are, are, are evergreen. So, uh, for example, in Colombia, like if you had asked me 10 years ago how many magnolias are native to the country of Colombia, I would say zero. I don't think magnolias grow there. Well, there's 34 endemic species of magnolias in Colombia, all of which are 100-foot forest trees with large evergreen leaves. So, in south, you know, southeastern China, uh, Viet, all the magnolias in Vietnam are evergreen, and they go as far south as Papua New Guinea. There's over 35 species of magnolias in Mexico, most of which are, are evergreen. So it's actually a fairly big genus, and what we see is actually a fairly uh, small subset. So this is Fortiana with uh, narrow evergreen leaves. 
This is a really interesting one, which I think could be used for uh, all sorts of hybridizing. This is uh, Foviolata shibamichi. I saw this in, uh, in northern Vietnam, right on, on the Chinese border. And Shibamichi is a, a, a Japanese nurseryman who selected this one. And it has this incredible kind of brownish gold indumentum. So if you can imagine maybe a grand flora instead of having brown on the underside, having gold on the underside. So this one is named for uh, Shibamichi. Do you have this here, Dave? Yeah, exactly yep. Well. You like it? I love it. Great flowers as well, you know, yellow, almost yellowish orange with a great uh, boss of stamens in the center. Uh, for a little bit of fragrance, blooms kind of late winter, early spring. Now that, you know, to me that doesn't look like your typical magnolia. So Anita Figler, uh, in Cygnus, is uh, kind of a pinkish red. And this is one, it's actually in Cygnus that people feel will get the true red magnolia from, because there are some uh, versions of this that are uh, pretty, pretty close to red. Again, uh, an evergreen tree, 25 feet tall, blooms in late fr spring, fragrant. Do you have straight in Cygnus? Does well. See, you guys are so lucky. You can grow all these things. I can, we can grow them like in, in a greenhouse. <laughs> now, if you look at the, the, this color here, you know, that's... I mean, it's still called a pinkish purple, but you're getting close to, to red. Uh, this is Magnolia Lavifolia Michelle. So a lot of these, like Lavifolia, used to be under a different genus called Mycelia or Mycelia. And then there's another kind of tropical Magnolia genus called Mangalicia. They're all now considered Magnolias. Uh, so this was uh, uh, selected by Tony Avent at Plant Delights Nursery. Uh, gets about 18 feet tall, blooms midwinter, uh, fragrant, uh, evergreen. There, that's the one at, at Plant Delight. So, you know, incredible in it, that it's evergreen, but also real profusion of, of flowers. We were talking about this one earlier. This is a Maudier, which uh, uh, Dave has here at, in, the, in the gardens and Arboretum. Uh, Midwinter flowering, uh, about 20 feet tall, fragrant. This is uh, uh, proved to be a you know, quasi-popular street tree in Portland, Oregon. Now these are all, I would say, this group that I've just shown you, these evergreen ones are all zone eight. We grew... I tried many of these in Swarthmore, none, none of them survived, so I know they're not hardy in zone, zone seven. And then I'll finish with another one that looks a, a little bit like um, uh, Fortiana, Uuanensis. I know that's a mouthful. And it is around, I've seen them in like Camellia Forest Nursery mail order catalog. So if you're looking for magnolias for sale, some of the good sources are Camellia Forest has a lot of kind of Asian evergreen magnolias. Woodlanders in Aiken, South Carolina mail order, that's more uh, native magnolias. Um, uh, Rarefy Nursery, which is in New Jersey. Uh, Broken Arrow Nursery in Connecticut. Gosser Farms in, in Oregon, and then Song Sparrow Nursery, which is in so southern Wisconsin. You know, if you go between those, you could probably collect 300 cultivars. Uuanensis is also now being used in hybridizing. Uh, Kevin Paris is at uh, Spartanburg Community College in South Carolina. He's, U he's using Uuanensis in a lot of his complex hybrids, so... You know, what I like about Uuanensis and Fortiana is that narrow foliage. I think texturally that's quite a bit different than, you know, most magnolias I've seen before. And I'll, I'll just finish with this one. This is uh, just close-up of the foliage of Uuanensis. So 
I'll finish with that. Any questions? Okay. Yes. Okay. And I kept waiting to see if you were, but we don't know what it is. I mean, it sounds like the star magnolia, magnolia stellata. Like, is it white? Yes, it's white. And when, in what month does it bloom? February, March. Yeah, pro probably stellata. Yeah, that's, you know, stellata, and it would, it's yeah, blue. yeah, it would be a star magnolia for sure, because it blooms so early. Yeah, okay. Do we have those here, David? Yes, you have, you have stellata here, right, David? Is it across the street from her? Yeah, Royal Star is a good one. Fairly, fairly common. Okay. Yep. Anybody else? Yes. Oh, go ahead. Right, so to make a hybrid, you need, um, uh, uh, well, any magnolia flower has both the male and, and female parts, but what you want to do is take, uh, kind of think of what you want. So let's say, let's just take the star magnolia. So, you know, you have a star magnolia that's white, but maybe you want it to be more pink. So then you might take pollen from, say, L Leonard Messel, Put it on your your uh, uh, the, the female flower parts, and then what you what people often do is cover that whole flower in some some sort of screening or something so that other pollen doesn't come in. And also, if you cover in some sort of screening, you know something where it's still a sunlight and, and air can get in. Then when it when it sets the actual fruit, then the squirrels and birds and whoever won't get it. Then you harvest that seed, sow the sow the seed. And within you know, less than a year, you'll start getting seedlings. Probably in t two to three years, those seedlings of your hybrid will set flowers and you can see what they look like. You know, maybe they're what you envision, maybe they're even better than what you envision. And I would say most of the magnolia hybridizing that's going on in the United States, if not the world, is amateur hybridizing. So it's, uh, you know, they're easy to grow from seed. Uh, they're relatively easy to hybridize from a kind of an amateur uh, point of view and because they flower so quickly as a young plant you can see the fruits of your labor per pretty quickly. Uh, I mentioned the Magnolia Society earlier, do my Magnolia Society commercial, www.magnoliasociety.org. It's only $30 a year and one of the, the things we have, the benefits for members is called uh, the seed counter, the seed exchange. And for $3 you can buy seed, and some of them are actually, uh, they're different species or cultivars, but some of them are actually hand crosses that some of our uh, kind of amateur hybridizers have done. So, you know, it tells you what the parents are, what, but what's the great thing about plants is even though you know what the parents are, there's always some level of uh, genetic variability. So even in, say, if you sow 10 seeds, they're not all gonna look the same. You know, you might get one that's even a little more dwarf or has more flowers, whatever the case might be. And that's how a lot of cultivars come to be is people maybe do multiple generations of hybrids, pick one that's exceptional and put a name on it. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. Right. I, yeah, I, I don't think I don't I don't think they do because you'll see like uh, you know what I would consider more northern types and fairly southern climates. You know, like I would say almost every deciduous one I showed here does perfectly well in like uh, Pasadena or you know Southern California where it gets you know pl plenty hot and actually is fa fairly dry. Uh, so I think it, as a group they're pretty versatile. Obviously the real Southern ones aren't going to do well in northern climates, but the more northern ones do well almost anywhere, except for, you know, probably real tropical climates. And what's the darkest? What's the darkest? <laughs> yeah, darkest. Um, hmm, I'll have to think about that. Yes. 
Yeah, they'll store, store for several years. So what you want to do is, um, you know, you, you have to clean them. So they have, you know, this red coating. And what you want to do is just soak them, clean off the, the, the red skin, uh, dry them, and then pack them in like a milled sphagnum or even like a, a fine peat moss. Don't keep them too, too moist, but don't keep them uh, too dry either. And then you can just put them in your refrigerator and probably at least five years of viability. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you. Okay.